Welcome to the ultimate crash course for clinical trial coordination and management. Okay, so we have 10 topics to cover, but before that, we just want to get a very general understanding of what a clinical trial is. So let's break it down. The first thing is the word clinical. So whenever you hear the term clinical, whether it's clinical research or clinical trial, it means that it involves human subjects. It means the person or the population that is being experimented on happen to be human beings. As opposed to in lab settings, your population can be various cell types, bacteria, it can be animal models like mice, rats, rabbits, pigs, various things. However, whenever you hear the word clinical, it means it involves human subjects. Now, next word is the word trial. So whenever you hear trial, typically it refers to a randomized control trial. There are many different types of trials, but in the context of the kind of jobs you're applying to, whenever you hear the word clinical trial, they will usually refer to a randomized control or a double blind kind of trial, which means they're testing something against something. So there are different variables like maybe a healthy population versus an unhealthy sick population or this population is getting a medicine, that population is not getting a medicine and they're comparing one against the other in a trial setting. They're trialing out or testing out whether changing one thing can change something else. Changing one variable can change another variable. So that is the meaning of the word trial. So clinical trial is essentially a study, it's a research it's a kind of research study in which you are testing something on human beings in order to see whether you can cure a disease or something can get better or better health outcomes can come. It can be various different things, but you're testing something out with hopes of improvement. And typically there is a healthy population and a sick population, or there is some kind of a interventional group and a control group. So whenever you hear the term control, it means somebody who doesn't have you know, the ideal things you're looking for to test on. For example, you are testing out a drug on cancer patients. So you have a group of specific kind of cancer patients and you have a medicine to test on them. But how will you know if this drug is the thing that's making the person healthier or if it's like placebo effect or it's like some other general thing that the population is suddenly getting better. For that, you will also need to have a control group and you will treat the groups exactly the same except for the drug that you are only giving to this group. So maybe you have two groups of cancer patients and one is getting the drug, one is not getting the drug. Or you are just monitoring cancer patients over time and monitoring a same group of healthy people with maybe same age, same sex, same other features. But you know, this group doesn't have it. The control group essentially doesn't have the characteristic of interest that your target or interventional population has, right? So now in a randomized control trial, there are many phases. Typically phase one is more safety and preclinical and phase two is more you're finally giving the drug to the person who is, has the disease model. Then phase three is like a larger population of people who have the disease. And then phase four is after the drug has come to the market. So both Health Canada and FDA typically follow these four phases. There are slight differences in regulation and expectations between Canada and the US, but broadly this is what the phases mean in both countries. So whenever they ask you, okay, what do you understand by the phases? Just remember these things. You can do a quick search. I don't want to spend too much time on the phases because that's not really an interview question they ask too often, although I myself have asked this question in interviews. So I'm just lightly touching on this, right? So just have an idea. Like in phase one, you are just using your drug of interest and testing it on healthy people. Now, why would you test it on healthy people? Just to make sure that healthy people don't have any toxicities, you know, there is no side effect even in the healthy, perfect human body, perfect physiology, young, healthy people. But you want to see in a dose dependent manner or a time dependent manner, if these people are developing, you know, nausea, vomiting, or these people are reporting, you know, any dysfunction, any GI bleeds or anything else in a healthy population. So it's more a safety study. But in phase two, what we see more is like you are actually giving the drug. Maybe it's a blood pressure drug. So you're giving it to people who have high blood pressure, maybe who have hypertension. And now you want to see, 
Yes, is it reducing it? So you're testing the functionality or the efficacy of the drug. At the same time, you have a control group, which is again healthy. So in a small group of patients, in a small group of healthy people, you're actually testing out if the drug is working and if it's safe in both healthy people and in patients. Then in phase three, assuming phase one and phase two have been successful, you are now testing the drug in a much bigger sample size of unhealthy people who have the disease of interest, like say hypertension. So now maybe 500 people or a thousand people across multiple sites, you're testing it out. Once that is also approved with good colors, you can now bring the drug to market. Even after bringing it to market, sometimes we don't know what the long-term effects might be over a period of five years or 10 years. In those cases, we still have to continue monitoring the drug in the market, collecting you know, reports of like side effects and things like that, which is known as phase four. So these were our first four stages and this is what our clinical trial is. So this was our introduction. Now we're going to go into our 10 topics today, which is going to cover your crash course and prepare you entirely conceptually and thoroughly for any kind of interview questions. As long as you have a clear and thorough understanding, even if you don't have experience in doing those things at work, you can still pitch good answers. I myself didn't have all the experience in the world. I came from a clinical research background, which was not in a trial. I did more qualitative, I did more observational trials, but when I went into interviews, I had done a lot of reading, a lot of research online, offline books, in order to get an understanding of exactly how a clinical trial functions. So when they asked me a question, I was like, oh yeah, that must be this. So this is how I would go about handling it. Now, I personally haven't used this software before, but I know this is the purpose of it. This is when it has to be used. And if I have trouble, this is who I can call. So they were quite impressed with like my conceptual understanding and knew, okay, not everybody in the world can have experience in every kind of trial or every kind of software, but this person knows exactly how a trial works and nothing will be a shock or a surprise to her. So I did get hired for the role. So just like that, you can also watch the next 10 episodes of my crash course video. And if you like it, please don't forget to hit thumbs up, hit subscribe and follow my channel. I will be posting many more videos like this in the future as well. Now, without further ado, let's get into topic number one, which is the study startup.